This video is really about two issues. First of all, the expressive difference our performing choices can make. And secondly, the responsibility that musicians have when they take on the role of educators. In many respects, this video was inspired by, or more accurately is a reaction to, a couple of not particularly informed comments made by the well-known pianist Andras Schiff during a masterclass at Juilliard on October 16th, 2017. This masterclass, by the way, is available on YouTube. Discussing the second movement of the Italian concerto with one of the students, he said, and I quote, there is only one instrument that cannot play an appoggiatura musically, the harpsichord, because the second note will be exactly as loud as the first. Of course, this is totally wrong and shows a complete lack of awareness of the possibilities for subtle dynamic changes on a harpsichord. In fact, I made a video on this topic back in June called Concerning Dynamics and the Harpsichord, where I show how to achieve subtle dynamic changes. And of course, there are plenty of harpsichord recordings out there where careful listening confirms the presence of dynamic variety. On the other hand, it is not really surprising that Schiff made that comment, given that he has made it clear several times in the past that he's quite hostile to the harpsichord. And apparently, he's also uninterested in understanding Baroque performance practice in general, given that the above comment was preceded by yet another inaccurate assertion, and I quote again, So, clavicembalo with two manuals. That's why it's very seldom with Bach that we have no dynamics which leads me to wonder whether he has ever looked at any Bach score beyond the harpsichord pieces he performs. When it comes to the interpretation of music, obviously every artist should be free to choose their approach. So I'm not going to argue here that Bach should only be performed on historical instruments and only in a historically informed way. However, I think that first of all, Musicians must be honest about their choices, especially in an educational context, and not spread falsehoods stemming either from personal dislike or ignorance. And secondly, that if musicians are unwilling to understand the musical language and performing conventions of a composer's time, and if they refuse to familiarize themselves with the instruments composers had in mind for their music, they frequently end up overlooking the expressive potential of the music because they misunderstand the information that the score is trying to convey. This is indeed what happens when Schiff himself plays Bach. And I would like to demonstrate what I mean by looking at the piece he was discussing when he made the two comments I quoted, which is the second movement of Bach's Italian concerto. The first performing issue to deal with is that in this particular movement, each hand is supposed to play on a different manual. This is commonly regarded as allowing Bach to employ contrasts of piano and forte, as the upper manual tends to have a slightly softer sound compared to the lower manual. However, Bach's decision to specifically call for two manuals goes beyond this contrast. Since the keys of each manual pluck a different set of strings, and each set of strings is plucked at a different point relative to the total length of the string, each manual has a distinctive timbre. This is because plucking the string at a different point favors different overtones. Bach, therefore, can use the two different timbres that are available to him in order to create a texture that alludes to contrasting groups of instruments, which is a characteristic of an actual Italian Baroque concerto. 
This is practically impossible to replicate on an instrument like the piano, and especially the modern piano, because there is only one set of strings. To make matters worse, a modern piano is specifically designed to have a uniform sound throughout its range, so that this timbral contrast, which is so crucial to this piece, cannot be replicated. Now, turning to Schiff's performance of this movement, and there are actually multiple performances on YouTube, which show that his approach has remained fairly constant throughout his career, we find certain characteristics typical of 20th century traditional piano playing, a literal interpretation of the notes, regardless of their relative position within the measure, a melody-based approach, meaning that the left hand is subservient to the right hand, and the shaping of the music into long legato lines that, needless to say, are not present in the original score. This approach is completely foreign to Baroque aesthetics, which is based not only on the concept of short rhetorical gestures, but also on a non-literal approach to notation meaning that notes are given more or less emphasis and are held for a longer or shorter amount of time than what their value indicates, depending on their position within the meter. In other words, for example, not all eighth notes in a series of eighth notes are created equal. And here is where having a basic understanding of the harpsichord also comes into play because the instrument will also provide clues on how to play a piece, or at least provide a very different perspective compared to a modern piano. Let me try to imitate Schiff's playing. So I'll play the, the beginning of the second movement of the Italian concerto. Which will be a little challenging because I'm not used to doing this. etc., etc., Bach sometimes doesn't like to put a cadence in, so I would have to go another whole page before we get to a cadence. Um, so notice in, in this performance how achieving a long legato line is constantly thwarted by the harpsichord's faster, compared to the modern piano, sound decay, and how pointless it is to keep holding on to those long notes and trying to connect them to the notes that follow. In other words, the instrument is encouraging me to think in a different way, one that favors short phrases or gestures. The harpsichord is thus a perfect match for the aesthetics of the Baroque musical style. Let me try and give you one suggestion as to how we can shape these first measures in a very different, but also, as far as I'm concerned, much more expressive way. And before, before I play the, the same passage, notice how even at the very beginning, um, before I, I played something like... <laughs> 
so I'm trying to connect everything into, into a legato line. And obviously here, there are some things that happen between beats. There are other um, events that happen at the beginning of the measure, other events in the middle of the measure. So there is no distinction the way I played it up to now. So again, this is only my own approach to the piece, let's say. So this doesn't mean that everyone has to do it this way or that there is one correct way to do it. But the point is you have to do something. You have to differentiate between these gestures. So I would personally, when I have this, I would think that the last, um, the last two notes are at the beginning of the measure, so I would separate them. Um, so I would, do, I would do something like this. And then I can go on. Etc. Et Notice that I group the notes into short phrases or gestures and I keep these distinct from each other by separating them, kind of like using a comma or a period in speech. Sometimes I even separate between every note so that a single note, even a single note, can be an individual gesture. Notice also that I don't play all the notes in a literal way when it comes to their notated value. I linger more on the note at the beginning of a gesture and then play the rest of the notes a little faster. I also play the trills differently and I'll talk about that more in a moment. Finally, notice how varied these gestures can be and how, because of this variety, this piece can be so unpredictable because each gesture is so unique that we cannot really know exactly what will follow. Now, I'd like to stress that I'm not claiming this is how Bach would have done it. It's just one way of rendering all of these gestures expressively. It's a means of enunciating, if you will, syllables and words in a sentence and shaping them in an expressive way. In contrast, to use a brilliant analogy by cellist Anir Balsma, what Schiff does could be compared to talking while keeping his mouth constantly open. I want to briefly mention the trills that I played differently. I'm talking about these two specific trills right now, but um, actually this goes beyond just these two trills. But um, it's in the second line, at least, of the score that I'm using. So um, after I played those, um, those gestures that really consist of only one note, uh, let's see where I can start. Then it's these ones, which is what Schiff did. And then what I did was If we consult Bach's own table of ornaments, along with most other such tables of ornaments from that time, not to mention numerous treatises, this type of trill is performed starting on the upper note and not on the main note. Now, does this make such a big difference? I think so, because what happens is that by starting on the principal note, 
we emphasize the continuation of the melody while starting on the upper note interrupts the melody by adding a temporary spice, a temporary dissonance, so that there is a momentary sense of tension, of heightened expression, if you will. So the difference is because the, the melody goes... So... It kind of prolongs it, but if I, if I play, if I start the trill on the upper note, I'm adding this, this little dissonance because I'm delaying getting to where I want to go. Now, obviously, a performer can choose to play a different type of ornament, but real freedom of choice can only occur when our choices are informed. And somehow I'm not convinced that Schiff's choice is an informed one, as he keeps using the same type of substitute trill instead of what Bach specifies. Interestingly enough, the student in the master class also plays the trills starting on the principal note, and Schiff never asks if the student is aware of what he's doing, and that Bach's table of ornaments a trill starting from the principal note does not even exist. So, how does all of this affect Schiff's performance in terms of expressivity? I find his performance very one-dimensional, and here's why. Since Schiff does not really understand that this music is made up of all of these expressive gestures, he relies exclusively on dynamics to move the music forward. But since Bach's music is not written with the capabilities of the piano in mind, he can't really use the piano's wide dynamic range, as this would create an exaggerated effect. Therefore, what ends up happening is that most of his playing remains within a fairly narrow dynamic range. Couple that with the long legato lines that don't exist, and a literal interpretation of the notes, and we've got the perfect recipe for a performance that overlooks most of the expressive details of the music. What Schiff does not realize is that dynamic range in Bach's context doesn't have to do with contrasts of loud and soft, but rather with the proliferation and variety of expressive gestures. This is why having an instrument capable of a wide dynamic range is actually not necessarily an advantage because what we need here is an instrument that can bring to life all of these expressive gestures. And in this regard, the harpsichord, with its faster sound decay and contrasting timbres, has a clear advantage. The fact that Bach uses the harpsichord's entire range adds yet another element of expressive tension, as the use of the instrument's full resources exploits more of its capabilities. On the modern piano, by contrast, the piece's compass lies pretty much within the middle registers, so that the overall effect is much tamer, if you will, especially if the instrument's full dynamic range cannot really be used. Just a couple of quick disclaimers. First of all, my criticisms pertain to Schiff's performance, not to performances on the piano in general. Clearly, there are pianists who are aware of Baroque performing conventions and incorporate them into their performances of Bach. Secondly, when I mention that the harpsichord has certain advantages over the modern piano in this repertory, I am not implying that this music should not be performed on the modern piano. It's just that there is a tendency out there to regard modern instruments as somehow better than the instruments of the past. So what I'm trying to suggest here is that there is no such thing as a better instrument, but rather instruments with different capabilities. In other words, we have to realize that harpsichords and pianos are indeed different instruments with different capabilities, and as there are things harpsichords cannot do so well, there are also things pianos cannot do so well.
This is because harpsichords and pianos were designed with different aesthetic ideas in mind, and each one of them is excellent at doing the things it was designed to do, and not so good at things that were not part of the musical aesthetics of their time. And let's not get into the fact that pianos have changed so much that we can't really talk about a piano in a, in a monolithic context. So different pianos also have different characteristics. But for a moment, let's just concentrate on, let's say, the differences, especially between harpsichord and modern piano. Um, so we should also keep in mind that composers of the past did not write music for some sort of imaginary instruments for the future but rather wrote music that explored the capabilities of the instruments that they knew. This is why certain expressive elements in Bach's music work really well on the harpsichord, but not so well on the modern piano. As artists, we have the freedom to choose how to perform a piece. As educators, however, our task is completely different. It seems to me that the main task of an educator is to open up possibilities for exploration rather than shutting off perspectives they happen to disagree with. Even more crucially, they should not spread false information arising either out of personal dislikes or ignorance. This is especially true when the educator happens to be a well-known and respected figure in their field. Mr. Schiff has every right to dislike the harpsichord, but he should be honest about that and simply admit that he doesn't really know much either about the instrument or its capabilities. Likewise, if he is not interested in understanding the musical language of the Baroque, he should again be honest about that, because his refusal to come clean, so to speak, has two serious consequences. First of all, as a highly respected musician, his words carry a certain authority and erroneous assertions on his part are very likely going to be taken seriously and further disseminated. Secondly, by refusing to engage with historical practices, in effect, what he does is to, to close off a whole set of possibilities for the students. In other words, he does not let the students know that there are multiple performing possibilities out there, and his dismissive remarks may even discourage students from further exploration. Because, after all, education means expanding the students' horizons, not limiting them. And I'm not sure that in this masterclass Schiff did anything to expand anyone's horizons at all. As a postlude, if you will, I will include a performance of the second movement of the Italian Concerto. So, as always, keep in mind this is my interpretation of the piece. So, yes, I talk about these expressive gestures, but how we are going to render these expressive gestures, how we do all of these separations, how we don't play all the notes literally, this is going to vary from performer to performer. So, um, please do not regard this as a demonstration of how the piece should really go, or that this is how Bach would have done it as if Bach would always play the piece the same way um, throughout his life. So this is simply a way of trying to engage with my understanding of the Baroque musical language and, and trying to render these gestures as expressively as I can. As always, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoy the performance.